everyone, welcome to the Intense Mind, a podcast for intense people. My name is Emmy, and I'm here with you to learn and grow from gifted and intense minds around the world. So, in today's conversation, Fiona and I navigated the challenges faced by neurodivergent and intensely gifted people in traditional education. In this exploration, Fiona provides valuable insights into neurodivergence, giftedness, and the interplay of intensity and empathy. Our aim is to understand and support these diverse minds in a world that sometimes struggles to understand the depth and breadth of their cognitive and emotional intensity. Now to Fiona. Hi Fiona, welcome so much to The Intense Mind. I've recently renamed my podcast and I think you might be the first person here since I've Excellent. renamed it. Yeah, just something more explicit and reflective of what we're doing here. Mm. And so yeah, welcome. It's an honour to speak with you. Thank you. I love the name. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it didn't take me too long to think about it. It's very straightforward <laughs> and just is what it says on the tin mm, well first of all maybe I would like you to tell us a bit more about yourself and tell our audience about you who are you and um from okay. a, on a personal level do you consider yourself an emotionally intense or sensitive person okay yes I saw those questions um okay so thinking about that first up let me let me just introduce myself so I'm Fiona I am a psychologist. I'm not a clinical psychologist. Um, I'm a psychologist who also has a master's degree in gifted education, which I did at the University of New South Wales with Mirica Gross. So um, I had fantastic teachers because Mirica brought over a lot of people from different countries and we really, really had a great master's course. The reason why I started this course was due to my own parenting because my oldest daughter at four was the most intense person I have ever met. So we get into intensity very quickly. And at age four, my husband and I, who are both psychologists, took her to a psychologist to see why she was so intense. And they um, told us after doing some (laughs) examination and testing that she was very frustrated due to her high level of intellect. So basically I had a psych degree that I did a long time ago. I did the Masters of Education and I was at, Jerick doing my master's, that's the Gifted Education Research Resource Information Centre at the University of New South Wales. I was there doing my master's when Mirika decided she wanted to set up a psychology section at Jerick. I was very lucky. I fell into that role um, and I was able to register as a psychologist and then do the testing at the centre. So I've been very lucky to be working with this population um for the last 25 years so again not the same as a clinical psychologist because clinical psychologists deal with all levels of ability all different types of people Um, mine's very very niche and also it means that I probably have a bit of tunnel vision about this population as well too because I don't deal with a broader range but I do deal with all sorts of neurodivergency so not just the giftedness as neurodivergency, which I believe it is. Um, anyway, sorry, a bit, a bit too much. No, no, not at all. I believe it is too. And it sounds like it's an intersection between your professional and personal experience, which 25 years has been a long time. <laughs> 25 years actually working as a psychologist. Mm. More, more years parenting. Um, and when you asked about intensity, that is something that, is very dear to me because almost everybody that I work with, my family, my friends, I would classify as extremely intense, but Mm. I don't see that as a negative. I see that as not saying that you do, but I see that as a positive intensity Mm. for me, Mm. something that is very exciting, exhilarating, um, fun to be around. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the more official term might be overexcited, but even that, I'm not sure about yeah, the word over. Yeah, yeah. Again, when we try and translate that extremely long and difficult Polish word, we super stimulatability, I think, is what it comes out to, which, again, is not perfect either. I think it's a combination. Yeah, I think it's a combination, though, of intensity and sensitivity. So, you know, mm. it's an understanding of how we perceive sensation. 
well put. And would you consider yourself intense or not? <laughs> yes, I consider myself intense, but because but because I have the uh, other thing we're going to talk a bit about today, the aphantasia, the image free thinking. I think my intensity may be different and may mm. be perceived by others as different as well too. Mm. But I don't see it as any less intense um perhaps in a different way it's mm. my again as i said it's the understanding of how we perceive sensation so how aphantasics perceive sensation is very different to how mm. other people so as you can see my practice and when i started this 25 years ago i did not know i was aphantasic because nobody actually considered that as being part of the neurodivergency you know parcel um, so I've only discovered it in the last 10 years and it's an interesting part to add to the whole picture of, you know, who you are. So, yeah, I, I, as you can see, I'm very interested in how the children think. So when they come in to see me to look at their giftedness, et cetera, et cetera, I'm also looking at how they actually think, their pattern of their thinking mm -hmm. Um, whether they see images, whether they don't see images, all sorts of multi-sensory type of um, reactions. So, mm. yeah, it's a big part of it. Well, since you've brought it up, can you tell us more of your unique okay. way of seeing the world? Well, what I will explain for people who haven't encountered the uh, term first up is it is a definition which is a negative definition because it's a fantastic which means not capable of seeing images i prefer actually to call it image free thinking because i don't see it as a disability or a problem in any way so yeah you know, it's the same with any sort of new neurodivergency people who do not have that neurodivergency um don't really understand what it's like to have it so when i first encountered this and this was from my niece who also has uh, aphantasia or is an image three thinker we were telling our family members and they were just going no that's not possible you you cannot you cannot be a human without being able to see images so we were adults at the time and I'm like to my brothers what you're saying that you don't think I can think look at me I'm perfectly perfectly capable of running a uh, know a business etc cetera, etc cetera, and I have never had the ability to see images I just don't understand what it's like now within my own family I am a fantastic whereas my son who is the counselor here at Gifted Minds Dominic he's hyper fantastic so in other words he he sees yeah he sees images all around him all the time um he is intensely um, sensorily fantastic in terms of the fact that he experiences smells, music, images, textures, all of those um, in an imagination sort of way. So it, it look, it's semantics to a large degree. I mean, it's how you, how you even use words um, because if you they're talking about something now called multi-sensory aphantasia which is what I've just described, having aphantasia in all those areas. So I can't, if you say, think of velvet, I can't feel velvet or I can't experience the feeling of velvet. If you say, think of a song, um, I don't experience hearing that song. Uh, if you say chocolate, I don't experience tasting chocolate, any of those things. Now, apparently, my son does on each of those. But everybody has a different pattern of sensory experience and therefore everybody has, it's like being on the spectrum of sensory development. Um, but you did ask, one of the questions is whether I considered it, you know, to be a problem for me and how it affected my work. What it does do is give me the ability to be entirely focused in the present. So I am... And this works into the empathy thing as well too, which we were going to talk about. Because the focus is entirely on my environment, what is happening here at this moment, there's no visual imagery, no other imagery of any sort to interfere with how I am perceiving the person in front of me. That means I pick up every nuance of what's going on with that person. 
um, which is great when you're doing an IQ test, for instance, um, complete empathy with the person that you're working with. No distraction, no distraction. So another thing that would be interesting to look at is whether aphantasics have ADHD because, you know, there's, it's an atten- if there's a, an attention thing, I would consider aphantasics as having a, a hyper attention ability. A whole lot of research mm. out there. For people who are interested as we in, as they listen now, can you spell it? Aphantasia. Oh yeah, it's A P H A N T A F A N T A S I A A F A N T A S I A. It's the new best thing in neuro research. Everybody's mm. looking at it at the moment. It's a bit mm. like. Um, as I said, you know, people have differing levels of it um, and also about 1% possibly have high-level aphantasia in all different areas, but they're not quite sure. It's hard mm. to actually determine, and especially as it is in gifted, um, especially because a lot of the researchers doing the work do not have aphantasia. So it's hard to, as I said, to even use the language correctly if you don't have the experience. Mm. Mm. Do you have the data on the percentage of the population who could relate to that? Well, look, they they keep changing it. Like two percent of it's a bit like because it's in degrees. It's a bit like two percent of the population, maybe like the top ninety eight, you know, the ninety eighth percentile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as we also have used for you know determining giftedness in the past. Um, but my guess is that the more intense the experience, the more overwhelming in all the different senses, the fewer people there are as, as you mm. go into the extremes. Mm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, like a bit of a bell curve. Yeah, probably. Though, you know, the re- as I said, the research is brand new. It's only just really starting. But I think it's part of a much broader picture in which we're discovering that humans don't actually think the same way. Yeah, we yeah. all have different ways of thinking, and that has profound consequences for how we learn. So I think this is something that has to be taken into consideration by teachers because we can't assume that well, we have assumed based on how curriculum is designed that people think in similar ways, but it's becoming more and more evident that it's very, very diverse how we think. Absolutely. And on that, if we were to broaden our discussion to being different and being neurodivergent, growing up without having a name for what you have, what was it like for you? Were there any positive or negative experience that you can share? (laughs) Well, I never felt different to anybody else. I didn't realise that people saw images. Now, this comes up in something like People would say like, oh, you know, I can't sleep, I'm going to count sheep. And I'd be like, okay, so I didn't even think about that. That was simply that maybe they're just counting because it's boring just to lie in bed and count. I never even considered that people could see sheep jumping (laughs) over fences. just didn't occur to me. So I did not feel different to anybody growing up in terms of that ability or lack of ability. Um, I think, and this is in talking with my niece, that, The main difference from our perspectives, and again, this is just very specific to us um, and I can't speak for other people, is that when, with an aphantasic, when you are not with a person directly, that person is not in your mind, so you're not thinking about them. Um, So my niece has said that that has caused some issues with relationships in Mm. terms of the fact that people have said when I'm not with you, you don't have any, you don't, you know, you're not thinking of me in any way. And she said, yes, that's the case. But when I'm with you, I'm entirely and utterly with you. Mm. So, um, you know, I guess it's a bit of a trade-off. It doesn't mean that we have any problem recognising faces or anything like that. It's not an issue with that sort of thing at all. Um, My facial memory is fantastic. I know people instantly that when I see them, it's not affecting that. Um, yeah, it's very difficult to understand, as I said, from people who don't have it because visualisation and visual imagery is so tied up in how we think we think. So, yeah. you know, it's even you read a novel and it will say very often in a novel, 
in their mind's eye, blah, 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 in their mind's eye. Again, it's, I'm an avid reader. I've been reading consistently. I love books. I've lived with books all my life. The best thing about being an aphantasic and a reader is that you don't build up any mental images. So if you do go and see a film of a book, you don't care how they portray the person because you've never seen it in any other way. Mm. I must say, listening to that, I do find it really unusual because if we were to place people on the spectrum, I'm an extremely strong visual thinker. If anything, I've got not not much of an audio. I had to train myself to listen to audio book in the, uh, ten years ago, maybe. And so, for example, when I memor when I study and memorize information when I was preparing for examinations, I had to when I recall information, I recall where they are in a book. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Like, let's say I try to spell. So I often misspell things that look very similar because I'm a visual person. Mm, Even mm. if they sound very, yeah, the sound of it doesn't matter because I'm such a visual memorizer as well. So yeah. what you're describing just sounds so <laughs> interesting and strange and unfamiliar to me. Um, and what is so fascinating for me is the difference between Dom, my son, and me. And we're both working with gifted children and we have you know such different ways of expressing and thinking and when we're talking about the child that uh, we're working with um, he's obviously seeing an image of that child and you know mm. thinking about it and I'll be like come back come back I want to, I want to talk to you um, and you know stop getting distracted by that you know what it actually happened what was your experience etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, it doesn't stop my creativity in any way. Uh, I write, um, I like to paint, I do various things. Um, I can't think of anything that I've missed out on due to that. But I guess my fundamental way of living has been affected simply because it's different. You know, in everything that is different, maybe in some aspects of my schooling, if if teachers were expecting me to be able to visualise something, for instance, just I do yoga. I love I love to do yoga. It's part of I my centering. Um, yeah, but I don't I don't meditate because I can't take myself to a place. <laughs> but I do listen to chanting, and I do listen to Tibetan sound bells. So the music and the chanting help calm me but I cannot visualise, a you know, a quiet beach or a, <laughs> a lotus field pond or anything like that. Hasn't stopped yoga being very important for me as a relaxation tool. Oh, that makes sense. Hmm. So in your work with people, I, I, I think it's wonderful that you haven't been traumatised and hurt and had an awful experience of being different. But you work with a lot of people, and I'm sure you had in the last 25 years of experience. Um, have you observed any common themes in people that you work with, gifted people or people with neurodivergence, certain themes or even traumatic experience in mm. their childhood or adolescence? Look, Imi, the problem for me has been the degree of difference with the children that I work with, including my own children, has caused huge issues at school. So for mm. me, the schooling experience has been the trauma right. for these children. Um, and, look, I'm not here to denigrate schools or teachers in any way, um, and I have the greatest respect for teachers because working with a classroom full of mixed ability children with learning disabilities and without learning disabilities, I think that is admirable and very difficult. So my work with a child is one-on-one -on -one or optimal experience. I'm totally focused how wow. a teacher works with, you know, 25 to 30 kids. I have no idea. But I do think that the gifted and the neurodivergent kids of all types miss out in the classroom because often they're masked and often the teacher simply doesn't have time or knowledge. They're not trained in this. Um, so they are missed. The kids are completely missed. So the trauma that I've seen in the children has usually got to do with their schooling experience. Mm. 
can you give us some examples of these mm. experiences for them? Actually, it's actually let's, really let's hard. focus it's really on hard something. To talk about simply because the children come to see me and Dom, Dom and I in terms of, and they almost have uh, post traumatic stress disorder. They are so. Oh, they're so distressed. You know, I've seen a child that um, has been in the classroom with the identification of ADHD, ASD. They're on medication for that. Um, the medication has impacted on their eating and their sleeping. They're on sleeping tablets. They have then got anxious and depressed. They are on antidepressants. And there is a guard at the door so the child doesn't try and leave the classroom. Um, the best case scenario for that particular child was the understanding that he did not have any of these. And I'm not saying there aren't gifted children that that don't that do have. I mean, I'm saying there are gifted children that have ADHD and ASD and everything. I'm saying that, but in this particular case, this child did not have ADHD or ASD. He had been completely and utterly missed in terms of his intellectual ability. And by the time we saw him, he was so flat, depressed and medicated that it took us a long time of unschooling him before we could actually find what his intellectual ability was. And it was phenomenal. He was sitting in the classroom on a daily basis, completely underestimated, misunderstood, completely and utterly bored. And we failed him in every possible way we could fail him. Uh, he was homeschooled in the end and could go to the level of his ability to the degree of his challenge and at the pace he needed, and that made all the difference. He did go back into the school system, but later when people understood more about his trauma and also about the real, you know, needs that he had. Oh. In what way did the system fail him, apart from not providing the stimulation? Well, the system failed in terms of the fact that they looked immediately at a disorder. Right. They did not even contemplate that this child might be gifted. Um, and, look, again, as I said, I can see how that happens. You have a child, especially a... If you have a child who has a very strong visual-spatial processing type of child, Often they go inside their own head because it's much more interesting than the classroom. So they are, you know, these are the very visual kids. They see things so they can entertain themselves up here and that will look like they have either autism because they are not interacting with other kids or ADHD because they're not attending to the teacher. So prior to making these identifications or disorders it's always good to check whether the child is experiencing the degree of challenge they need in the classroom first up and if they are and then all these things are present then yes I totally agree go for the diagnosis but first up let's just see if they've got the mental challenge they need to avoid the boredom that causes huge levels of frustration and lots of symptoms yeah. So if you were in a room with the teacher, rewind the clock, what would you how would you advise these teachers to look well, further, deeper, differently? A lot of the a lot of the time, I mean, with this particular child, he'd been in the system, you know, he was in year three. So it wasn't that particular teacher's, you know, the kid had by the time they got to year three, that child had been mishandled. And I'm not saying it was just the teachers, it was also the professionals that were dealing with him. And, again, this is not their fault. There's just no training out there. They do not have training to look at differences in intellectual ability and how that affects various aspects of even checklists. You know, the ADHD checklists we have, the Connors checklist, for instance, has not been normed on the gifted population. Mm. Um, we're talking about intensity. <laughs> mm. If you look at how intensity infiltrates uh people who think differently, then you are going to have issues with checklists that don't take that population into consideration. Um, yeah. So, look, I don't want to come across here, Emmy, as someone who is a dinosaur who doesn't believe in neurodivergencies of this sort or someone doesn't believe in medication. Certainly I think they have their place. Mm -hmm. I just think there is a lot of 
room for more nuanced examining of these mm. children before we move into that. Mm. Absolutely. What would be your first advice to a teacher who is, say, overwhelmed, judging yeah. their kids mm-hmm. and, oh, God, I don't know what to do with this yeah. child? Look, children present in entirely different ways, okay? Often it's the child that gets your jokes. <laughs> child, the child who displays <sighs> that sense of humour. Mm. Um, the child who picks up your nuances, um, knows when you're in a bad mood or knows if you're sad, when you're trying really hard not to show it. It's also the child that might be persistently annoying in terms of the questions they ask, which will be very different to other people's questions. Um, anything that's out of the ordinary like that would be like a, a, a red flag. Let's see what else that child can do. Things like, you know, academic stuff, like early reading. I've seen very gifted early readers who read fluently at four, go to school at five and stop reading altogether because it's not what the other children are doing. They norm reference, they check what the others are doing, they don't want to stand out and they they stop doing it. So often it's not, the teachers can't see it at all. That is what so, is so depressing when you see a child and it you know how brilliant they are and it's mm. not showing up in the classroom at all it's not the teacher's fault it's it's the curriculum and also just the way we educate as as I've said before I mean the fact that we believe that everybody thinks the same way therefore they learn the same way oh. do you so see what, what, yeah so looking for those things but also asking the parents I mean a, a child and I know the teachers simply don't have time either and it's, it's really tricky um, but asking if there's a child that's um they're not picking up in terms of their ability in the classroom you know parents generally are not I've discovered through my 25 years they don't run around saying I have a gifted child unless their child is actually pretty bright I mean it's not necessarily fun having an intellectually gifted child um in the school environment and a lot of parents very quiet about it they don't want to be seen as seen as pushy they you know want to belong they don't want to see they don't want their child to stand out they're very concerned about the child having friends um there is a complete lack of understanding not just by the teachers but by the community and by parents that this is the only time of our lives when we're at school and we're actually forced to be friends with people born in the same year as us I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't hang around with only people born in the year I was born. Mm. It's school. It's an artificial environment where we've decided in the last 200 years, I might add, that this is the way that we should be taught. Um, So, yeah, looking for this kid in the classroom that, you know, you might, might be gifted, you might know, they're not necessarily going to be the child who does well on the class tests. They are not necessarily going to be the child that, you know, stands out as academically gifted. The children that stand out as academically gifted usually are not the very highly gifted or exceptionally gifted kids because for them the school is still interesting, the subjects are engaging and they don't make simple errors on stuff that they are just totally bored with. Sorry, I went on a rant. (laughs) No, I agree so much with that. Um, what did my coach call it? Like the convent, he made he made it sound a bit. It's hard to use words without certain people interpreting certain things negatively or overly positively. Yeah, he said there's a conventional gifted and the unconventional gifted, but I think he's referring to what you were saying there, where there are people who are bright and very good academically and they are on the path of becoming the doctor the lawyers and they do very well in the system and Mm -hmm. then there are the really bright and creative mind who just cannot fit in the schooling at all yeah Yeah. look and then there's room for both I'm not saying that we need all to be one or the other I just would like the innovative creative thinkers who are right outside the box to have that brilliance recognized and catered for in a way that doesn't 
you know, squash them um, and cause them grief throughout their schooling so that they come out of schooling or they come out thinking that they're stupid or there's something wrong with them or that they're broken and they need to be fixed. Um, some of the most brilliant kids I've worked with, some of the high, most highly gifted kids have been way, way out of the box thinkers, <laughs> kids that, you know, I and it's not the right place for them to be in their grade level at school because they don't think like those kids. They don't even feel like these kids and they don't have anything in common with their age peers either. So, you know, to put a highly or exceptionally gifted kid into a classroom and say they're socially immature because they don't get on with their age peers, <laughs> utter rubbish. They are not immature. They will never get on with their age peers because they do not think like their age peers in any way. They don't need, they're seven, they don't need to spend time with other seven-year-olds. You cannot teach them the social skills to spend with other seven-year-olds because they think like 14-year-olds. Um, that doesn't mean you have to put them with 14-year-olds either, but it does mean that they need access to higher-level material in just about every area and also just people to believe in them, to believe that, yes, they can work at that level. Um, what happens in the school system here in Australia and probably wherever is that, um, again, as I said, this is not the teachers, it's the ceiling of the material doesn't reach beyond the level at which these children can work, so they're never being stretched. Mm -hmm. So if they stay in that system where they're never being challenged, then when they finally are challenged, that is a scary experience. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them can be very resentful, um, they can be very anxious about it. They can, you know, literally lose it because they've never been taught how to try hard or even to take a risk or even to fail. Um, you know, <laughs> failure at something really important to you is different to just getting a very, very easy task wrong. Um, mm. But if you never get anything really important to you, you never learn that failure is actually a part of doing something. I, a part of me wish you could you know, really spread this news into schools and if gifted child, or gifted children would have known earlier, that would really change their lives. So I do see the importance in really changing the system and getting the message spread, but at the same time, the limitations. When I was a therapist in this school, I just felt so privileged. I mean, this room with all these toys and art materials of one boy. <laughs> and, and the teachers out there dealing with a lot uh -huh. more of them mm. yeah do you notice any gender differences in the way boys and girls mm. yeah, yeah struggles or are perceived though it's changed um from 25 years ago in 1998 <laughs> when almost everybody who was brought to Jerick for testing mm. was a boy um yeah. because <laughs> Well, the even board. now, I still think that it's skewed, but I'm but sure. But we used to say, I would say, you know, this is just doesn't pop in out of nowhere. This is a familial, it's highly heritable disability. Do you have any other children and parents? Oh, yes, I have my daughter, but she doesn't. She doesn't show anything. I'd be like, well, mm, might be worth having this child tested just to see, and invariably the child would test similarly, if not above. Um, so, yeah, actually that brings me to another line of fascination for me and that was <laughs> with the testing of girls um, and now trans children as well too, um, we miss out on a whole line of ability. So I started to look at matrilineal lines of ability because there are so many gifted women out there who do not accept their own giftedness never have even thought of themselves as Tell gifted. Tell me about it. Never had the opportunity to think that. So it's not that many generations past, Simi, where, you know, the highest you could actually aspire to as a woman was, uh, you know, a nurse or a teacher, and those were your gifted women, nurses and teachers. To become a doctor and a professor, one in so few of the people who could get through. So when I was working and testing the gifted girls, earlier on, I'd be saying, you know, to the mum, 
what's your experience? And they'd say, oh, it's not me, it's my husband. And I'd, I'd be like, oh, please, please don't say that. Look back along your own family line. Look at your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, your aunts, your great-aunts. Often you'll see that these are the these are the women, the secret, the invisible women generations back. And I'm sure that happens as well now with trans kids because, you know, things are so much, um, you know, people that we thought were spinsters and, you know, bachelors and people, I think this gender thing has been so complicated and made taboo for so many years that now we're seeing people of all sorts, all different types coming through and embracing their difference. So, yeah, I'm seeing more trans kids, as I said. Um, schools are dealing with more trans kids as well too. Um, and I think it's hopefully, fingers crossed, more accepted. Mm. I hope so too. Mm. Same as women. <laughs> Still mm. fighting for women as well. Mm. Are they usually bright in the same way but just oppressed in a different way or are they actually who sorry women and men the, uh, or girls <laughs> <laughs> ah, the oh, way their intensity or excitability or gift manifests itself do you notice any difference I mean, obviously i'm not looking for any statistics here but just observation no, 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 really. it's interesting again i think what's fascinating is that actually <laughs> uh, 25 years ago i may have said oh you'll see you'll see more boys doing better on quantitative reasoning sort of tasks, um, more girls doing better on literacy type of tasks. But that is changing as well too. I think it's not so much there's differences in ability. I think it's differences in our acceptance of people yeah. having that ability. Mm. So there, the girls are doing just as well on the visual spatial tasks as the boys, if not better, um, and the quantitative reasoning um, that, we can actually measure is similar across genders now as well too so yeah I don't think there's so much a difference in um how the brain functions and how we think but it's how we accept how different genders think so yeah interesting interesting question and also 25 years ago people would be saying oh the Girls are so sensitive and so intense and so shy and um, <laughs> the boys, you know, have to be strong and brave, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, thank God, that's changing as well too so that, you know, we need sensitive men. We need men that accept that they can be all those things. Um, and I've liked watching that change as well too, um, that acceptance. Mm. 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 Thank you for sharing that. In all your years of working with gifted clients, is there any particular experience or memories that jump out, if you can share one or two cases? Well, the child I spoke to before, the one that, um, yeah, ended up being homeschooled, that was one of them. Um, there are some there are some good ones as well, ones where things haven't been so dire. I think specifically... I have a couple of children that I follow. Um, the parents have kept in contact with me over the years, uh, both boys and girls. Um, the families have a male and female. One is particularly interesting um, <laughs> because the children are so very different. So there was a little girl who I tested when she was six um, and she just she tested well on the test I was doing at the time. But she, you know, wasn't she wasn't in the exceptionally gifted range or anything. She just was moderately gifted and did well on that. Um, <laughs> and she's now twelve, and she's doing HSC level maths, chemistry. Uh, that's year twelve level maths, chemistry, and um, Chinese this year. She's not showing up Chinese background. Um, <laughs> and her brother, she. The point was it's fascinating because she pushed herself. Nobody pushed her. We changed, we finally changed schools for her to a school that would accelerate her um, considering how she performed. And so she just kept on performing. So that's why she's doing year 12 because she's done everything along the way that she needed to do. Absolutely adored it. 
so academic and so brilliant with her academics. And then her brother, who's younger, <laughs> tested higher than her, but absolutely nosedived in the school environment, could not be catered for tech brilliance, like such a good um, knowledge and of how to code and pattern analysis and things like that. He hacked into the <laughs> private school <laughs> computer system. Seriously? When he was, when he was five. Um, and they did not find oh that it was like we did. <laughs> like, we're like, you have a five-year-old who can hack through your, your computer system. Don't you think this is amazing? Don't you think we should be doing something? No, this is not good, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he ended up, he ended up having to leave that school because they couldn't cater for him. And then he went to another private school. They couldn't cater for him. So this is another heavily homeschooled child. Yet within that family, there is someone who is in the system and having a great time in the system having taken control of her learning, basically. Mm -hmm. I guess the interesting thing in both these children's cases is that they are in control of their learning. Makes mm -hmm. a huge difference yeah. uh, to kids like this. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. So if someone listening to you and they suspect themselves or their kid might be gifted or excited, how would you suggest them to go about it now? Well, Amy, <laughs> my feeling is that if a parent suspects their child to be gifted, intense, whatever we want to call it, they likely are. Mm. It doesn't. You don't. You don't suspect this from nothing. You so, know that it's so important to hear because I yes. just hear this imposter syndrome again and again and again. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know. Trust the main my main advice is trust yourself. No one knows your, your child better than you as a parent. Mm -hmm. Nobody has that insight into that mind better than you because you're the one that's been there all the time with the child. So generally parents who think their child is gifted, <laughs> funny thing are usually gifted themselves, <laughs> but may or may not see that. But also the child generally is gifted in some area or another. Um, as I said earlier, most parents that I've worked with don't say or don't don't want necessarily that their child to be to be gifted. It's not a thing that you know. It's easier not to have that as a parent. But the ones that think their child is gifted is gifted, generally they have encountered giftedness either in themselves, their family. Um, extended family, they know that they're seeing something out of, you, out of the usual, mm -hmm. different, and that needs to be catered for in a different way. Mm -hmm. mm. And should they go for an assessment? I just, like, yeah. uh... Look, I, <laughs> I hate to think that the way that we define giftedness is based on IQ assessments because it's m much more than that. The only reason for me for using IQ is because sometimes that is the key to unlocking the changes at school that are needed. If we didn't need, like, you know, an IQ is just an estimate. We're not born with it tattooed on our forehead. It's not real. It's an estimate of ability based on a whole lot of different tasks, how you approach them, how you think, how you use your reasoning, your pattern analysis and things like that. It's also quite culturally bound up. Um, certainly it has a bad history of use in the past. But if I can use anything to put one more piece in that puzzle of who that child is, I will use it because it's the only thing we've got at the moment that helps. I was going to ask, like, would you suggest them to go with something like Mensa or go to a private psychologist? Well, Mensa don't... But... Sorry, I'm not sure. I mean, with Mensa, I thought you had to have an IQ test to get into Mensa, unless Mensa does their own testing. They do their, they has, they do their the own testing. I think adults do their own testing. Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. For adults. I have a lot of children's parents that write and say, can you fill in the Mensa form based on the IQ test? So I'm pretty sure you might need an IQ test mm. if it's a child. Mm. Adults, I think, do you can test into Mensa. Look, the thing with Mensa, the thing with Jerry, the thing with anything that caters for gifted kids Taste it and see. If they like it, 
great. If they don't like it, don't make them do it. My own kids didn't want to do any of those things simply because their free time was their time to be creative, explore, find like minds in environments that they were interested in. But I'm not saying they're not good chances to find like minds. It does give you the opportunity to do that. I do think it liberates a lot of people who have struggled all their lives in finding like-minded people. Yeah, yeah anything where everyone. you can talk to people and you can come out of that, you know, shell that we've created around us um, because being different is not seen as a good thing. I think it's great to hatch. <laughs> and if you can find a place to hatch, you're okay. Mm, I hear you. <laughs> to hatch. Yes. <laughs> So let's slightly shift our direction. A lot of people with overexcitability do struggle with physical sensitivities in a busy world. Do you know, do you teach them how to manage it in particular yeah, ways? Yeah, I mean, I'm laughing because it's so common. Um, and, uh, and it's also common for a lot of the uh, other areas of, you know, neurodivergency as well too. So I was laughing because yesterday there was a, an article about these glorious new clothes that are coming into the market that are for the sensory, you know, people who have sensory issues. No way, I, really? Yeah, I swear, these are the clothes I would love. I hate tags. I hate I hate things against my skin. Great I have to business wear idea. Yeah, I have to wear cotton and silk and stuff that's soft. I've never seen it, again, maybe I'm just... Maybe I'm just weird. I've never seen anything that I have as a disability. Um, so when you talk about sensory issues, my take on it was, okay, you have a child who freaks out in the supermarket, probably because there's fluorescent lights going, probably because there's too much noise, probably because the trolley rattles, probably because there's some of the stimulation of colours and products. If you can avoid taking that child into that situation, avoid it. Um, not not solved, but at least find a smaller supermarket that you can introduce them slowly or a corner shop or something like that. Generally, with the sensory issues, unless they're debilitating, like really you can't walk outside, et cetera, et cetera. You know, my daughter didn't like sand. We didn't go to the beach for a while. My son wasn't keen on putting his feet on bare grass. I put shoes on him. There's things that you can do that, you know, your kid only wants to eat three different types of food. That's a bit more of a problem. You know, we've, I've seen children will only eat white food. Um, that was considerably more of an issue and we could work with that. But some of the lesser sensory things, like I had a tent set up in my living room when my kids were little, um, a little tiny tent which was filled with cushions, soft blankets, soft toys. Um, and I would say, you know, if anybody's feeling overwhelmed, you can get in, just relax in the tent. Now, there's five-year gaps between each of my kids, um, so <laughs> they weren't close in age. Um, but I would also say, look, I'm going to get in the tent with a book because I am overwhelmed by all of you. And so, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's just, finding space um, and believing that the child can self-soothe themselves if they have a space, a, sorry, a space where they can do it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's not possible. I mean, you know, some people don't live in situations where, you know, they can have a, a private space. Mm -hmm. um, my, my oldest daughter, the one who got me into this area in the first place, was a massive tantrum thrower. They were exacerbated by sensory overstimulation. Um, the only thing I could do at one point in her life was just hold her while she kicked and screamed and yelled, just hold until she was over it. She was four, and then she would say, I just can't help it, I can't help it. It's like a pressure cooker and they've taken the lid off the top. It just explodes. Yeah, so I found lots of ways to try and soothe. And one of them also was baths, like warm baths. Um, my children used to have their dinner in the bath because sometimes it was better to have them soothed and quiet in the bath. So, yeah, sensory sort of stimulation. I don't think we all need to be the same in the way that we experience and or react to sensory stimulation. I think there's room for a lot of variance. And as I said, 
it's only a problem as far as I'm concerned if it's debilitating. Mm. I really like how you deal with things in a very matter of fact way. <laughs> I don't know that my daughter does. I think she might think I'm a bit too matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, well, problems you 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 directly solve the problem. So, mm. but also the other thing with parenting these sorts of children is that you've got to get rid of the idea that, and this is going to sound controversial, um, and that it's not even the right word. I'm not going to say you can't back them into a corner. Don't back your child into a corner such that it's my way or the highway, they will never react well to that. These children are brilliant reasoners. Their brain is on fire with reasoning. So if you give them no choices at all, I tell you what, they'll outstubborn you. They will outstubborn you in any way they possibly can. So it's a negotiation. And I know it sounds difficult um, for parents, especially busy parents, parents who are working, but if you can approach that sort of situation where you can see that you're backing slowly into a corner for this child um, and then you can give them some some choices you're going to have a better job than if you are in that corner with them because that just becomes problematic for your relationship with the child if you have to call the I'm the parent you're the child card that child will you know not respect you because they they can't. They they need to know the reason as to why and they need to have some control over what happens. And um, I, I don't think that's weird for a child who has that sort of thinking. I don't think, you know, I'm not saying that if you're on the street and your child, your four-year-old child is going to run under a car, yes, you pull the child off the street. You don't negotiate. Would you like to come back or would you like to do it a different way? Certainly there's times where you have to act but if you have to act and you have to act fast as a parent after the situation has happened you then take the time to talk not when the child's upset when the child's calm about the fact that look most of the time I will give you a choice I'll give you a realistic choice but occasionally I will be tired I'll be angry there will be danger there'll be something and I will want you to do something immediately and you will have to do it but most of the time we'll be able to negotiate. I mean, it's, mm. yeah. <laughs> I'm just so glad my children aren't children anymore. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> You've done incredibly well. Mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Mm. I think they never they never stop being your children. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to drive back into another topic that I think you have a personal experience, strong personal experience with, which is intense empathy. Mm. Do you think yeah. a lot of gifted people have intense empathy? Because that would be quite contrary to the yeah. very, very stereotypical Spock-like, you know, Look, you mean, stoic. Go on. I did a uh, talk at the Dabrowski Congress on empathy quite a few years ago, and I've reconsidered a lot about of that now in that the empathy I was describing <laughs> was an empathy that may be peculiar to me, and I don't know whether it was to do with my aphantasia or not. What happens when I am working with a child, one-on-one -on -one with a person, is that I become physically or viscerally empathic with that person so that my blood pressure rises, I my pulse rate rises. So it's like a physical response to their physicality. I will know exactly when they're getting bored or when they need a change of pace. Um, it's almost like a clicking in to the, per, the body of the person, like it's like I'm so focused. Now, when I try and think of, like I, I can explain that empathy based on the fact that I am so completely focused on the child or the person. Yeah. But when we talk about empathy generally, this walking in another's shoes, mm. and as I said, and getting blisters, <laughs> um, it's, it's different to that. So I looked at empathy, before I gave that talk, I looked at empathy in a number of ways. I also looked at the empathy that you get from reading. Apparently there's some research being done on the fact that 
readers often are better at empathising because they learn how to put themselves into the position of the protagonists mm-hmm. in the books. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm a bit puzzled about whether or not empathy in itself is related to intensity, but I do think that what you will have is children looking much, much more early um, at moral compass type of things and concepts. So, you know, I think empathy is obviously conceptual in nature, but then you'll then get at a very early age, and this is what I've worked and seen over the last 25 years, interest in death much earlier than you would expect, interest in love, what does that mean, interest in religion, uh, questions about God, questions about heaven, um, things that parents would expect to get from 12 to 14-year-olds about sex, thing, every sort of thing much, much earlier. Mm-hmm. So I think whether or not empathy or moral reasoning or that sort of conceptual understanding can be seen in gifted um, people, I don't know, the jury's out on that, but I do have experience anecdotally and and I think possibly in research that that sort of um, understanding of concepts comes in much earlier. So when you can conceptualise um, at an early age and you're given the time and space to do so, so you've got to realise also that our very gifted young kids have huge um, input of screens as well too. So, uh, and I'm not going to say I have a problem with screens because I don't. It's just that if there's a change in the way things um, are remembered and in the way things are actually thought about based on screens. If you pick up a book, just to be completely tangential, but if you pick up a book that was written in the 50s, for instance, pick up The Hobbit. Okay, we all know we've seen the movie. You read how Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, which is for children. The sen- The paragraphs are about, you know, 20 lines long, the words are very different sort of vocab. You pick up a book that's written for children now, published in 2023, sound bites because that's how attention has changed. So, yeah, I think providing the child with the space to think but without boring them is probably (laughs) the probably thing we're looking at. giving them the chance to explore concepts um, in a meaningful way, I guess, is probably the sort of way to engage this heightened moral reasoning, this heightened interest in concepts. But if we don't give them the time and the space and the means to do by, to do it and the audience even and someone to talk to at that level, then we'll probably miss that. Yeah, so sorry, I didn't really talk about empathy because my, I'm up and down about what that means. Mm. I mean, I think I think I read the paper you wrote about how that could be tough on you as a therapist, where you seem to absorb the other person's energy, which is something I hear quite a lot from people where they are quite okay. energetically porous. Yeah, well, that is a great word. Yeah. I do have massive blood pressure. Like after this, my blood pressure will read extremely highly, not because I'm anxious, not because it's stressful, just because I have been putting everything that I'm thinking into answering the questions, and that will raise my blood pressure. It's just weird. (laughs) It's an odd thing. I appreciate you doing this for us. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I've come to learn more about myself, I didn't used to because I obviously always tried to be normal. I thought I was so introverted that I can't deal with social environments. But actually, once I've identified my people, I realize I actually do love being around them and not shy at Mm. all. But what I need is three days and three nights to recover from one social exchange. So now I actually adjust my diary for it. I don't schedule any work on the day after. I just have to make it like a proper thing that I do. And it's it would look very abnormal to someone who just have a normal social life. <laughs> it's yeah. about you and accepting yourself and planning ahead. You've said something very important there about normal. I mean, 
normal, what is normal for a start. But what you just defined there about what you do is what I have done. So the reason I brought Dominic on board as the counsellor is because the testing in itself, I have that empathic response, but I can bounce back fast from it. But mm. the counselling, that would drain me for days. So mm. he's come on board as a counsellor so that I don't have that, what you were describing, have to be on my back for three days or out of communication for three days because it's the, I guess that is the empathy with the feelings of the child and sometimes they were so desperate <laughs> that it would be so um draining for me yeah so I have made that change I used to do the counseling and the testing I don't do the counseling now occasionally occasionally but not to the same degree that I used to mm. in the end you have to save yourself because otherwise you're no help to anybody else uh, you know you have to find your own um, safe spots, your own limits, your own extremes to which you can go, basically. Absolutely. Wow. It's interesting hearing that. So what do you think make the counselling room so particularly more draining for you? Is it just an intense focus? Well, no. I feel think, what others feel? Yeah, no, I think it was because with the testing you're not, you're not measuring into their emotions, right? You're not in... You can see their emotions, you can pick up on their emotions, but generally what happens, what's so joyful about testing these kids is that they expand like flowers. They're like watching a flower bloom. I start off every test by saying, I don't want to bore you, okay? You're here today to do some things with me, to look at how you think, and I do not want to bore you. I know we get bored enough in this life as it is. Their faces just go, <laughs> Nobody's ever said that to them before. I uh, say, so having said that, there'll be some things in this that you are going to find boring. I'm really sorry, but I promise it will get more interesting. It will get more interesting. Oh. And so they hang on. And um, <laughs> what happens is because they don't know the level at which you're working at, you know, they just saw. They go, seven-year-olds go up to stuff you'd give 16-year-olds and um, they blossom. They open up and it's exhilarating. So I come away from testing exhilarated. Oh. From counselling, it's emotional. They're talking about being bullied. They're talking about being bored. They're talking about being frustrated. They're talking about not being understood. They're talking about lack of friendships. The negative impact, I think, is what causes maybe a physical depression so that it, I can't pull out of the blood pressure when I have to encounter that day in, day out. So, yeah. I learned that. Mm. Mm. And being a visual image free thinking thinker, mm. do you think that affects the way you empathize as well? Yeah, I think what's really good for me is that because I am image three, image free, <laughs> is and I've discussed this again with my niece, is I think it disinclines you to be uh, anxious because you don't perseverate on images, catastrophic images, okay? I can perseverate. I can script. Now, my son is flying at the moment. He's away on a holiday. I could sit here and think, oh, the plane's going to crash. He's going to have a terror. It's going to be this. Mm. I can script it, but I can't see it. Big difference, not seeing it, not incorporating it into the imagery, and I think that means I'm less less like, less less likely to be anxious and depressed. Though he is hyperphantasic, as I've told you, he doesn't get depressed or anxious either. So I don't know. Maybe I'm completely off. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. Very interesting. Um, yeah, but I I don't. So if I'm going to perseverate verbally about something, I can stop it. I can be like, that's ridiculous. Don't even think it because it's words. But with visual images, there I feel they might be more intrusive. Oh. Do you have any tips or strategies for our audience who might struggle with that? Yeah, look, when I said I did yoga, that's the reason I do yoga. And it's a very ritualistic uh, yoga practice. So I start off, I have a set of music that I listen to. I have the Tibetan bills I put next to me that I strike. I also have a little collection of 
plants and pretty images and things. So I sort of set up a little safe haven of where mm. I can sit and it's really important that I get mm. that. And I do that six days a week. Um, and I guess, you know, within the yoga that I choose to do, it's very soothing and soft um, and flowing type of yoga. Um, and I guess, you know, I sort of let it go. Literally, mm. I do a frozen. <laughs> I let it all go. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and for all the unique experience that you have both personally and professionally all these years. So any last piece of words or advice yeah. that you would give to our audience who are sitting I, on the fence maybe? I think I've said it already, but I truly believe that we need to trust ourselves. I think not only do parents know their children, when they look closely, they also know themselves um, and I think that so many parents that I see need to need to take the journey with their child. Okay, so when the child, you know, they think their child might be gifted, they get this test done if they do, and then that just opens. That's just the beginning. Okay, literally look into your own self and also your family to see how that has knitted you together, um, even your choices of friends and things like that. It's just the beginning of a journey that's going to be, you're on now for the rest of your life. Yeah, and what I probably feel from you is the ability to just be who you are and not apologise for it. It's all very, you know, just, well, you know, I have this trait, let's practically work out how to deal with it. There's no drama about it. And I, I think that strength is contagious no oh, good it's wonderful. <laughs> well i hope so okay i mean thank you for the experience and uh i'll let you uh edit and play around and let me know how it all goes okay. thank you so much for today thank you so much for your time yeah thank you Bye -bye. hey thank you so much for tuning in for more please head to eggshelltherapy.com there you will find more stories, articles and resources for people just like me and you. Bye now! Keep putting one foot in front of the other Moving forwards, never looking back Just one more foot in front of all those countless others And we're there Imagine that.